Ayn Rand's novel, We the Living, is set in post-revolutionary Russia, but it is a novel of timeless significance, not only about the evil of collectivism, but also about what it means to truly live. The novel's young heroine, Kira, is passionately devoted to her own life. In her unflagging pursuit of her own values, in the face of a brutal regime, there are universal lessons for us all. Today, February 2nd, is Ayn Rand's birthday. That's an added reason to explore her first yet least known novel. It is a book she called as near an autobiography as I'll ever write. And one thing we'll talk about is what Ayn Rand meant and didn't mean by saying this. Joining me today are Ankar Gatte and Robert Mayhew for a conversation about the life-affirming meaning of Rand's We the Living. Let me introduce you guys. Uh, so we have Robert Mayhew, who is a professor of philosophy at Seton Hall University and the author and editor of many books, including notably several collections of essays about Ayn Rand's novels, which cover both the philosophy and the literary aspects. And I'll highlight one of those, Essays on Ayn Rand's We the Living, which is really fitting for today's discussion. And Onkar is a senior fellow and chief philosophy officer here at the Ayn Rand Institute. He is a contributing author to many books on Ayn Rand's ideas and philosophy, including uh, the collections that Robert put together, which I just mentioned, uh, including this one on We the Living. And uh, I should mention that both members of the board of directors of the Ayn Rand Institute. It's great to have you both with us today. Good to be here. Yeah, it's great to be here on Ayn Rand's birthday. So I thought we should start with uh, the kind of question that some people might have on their mind, which is, we the living today. The book was written 85 years ago. It's set in Soviet Russia. Why do you read the book today? What, what, what is there in it for a reader? What, what can they gain from it? Well, it's hard to know where to begin um, because it was most emphatically not just a historical novel uh, that was significant as if it were some naturalist uh, piece that you know ages after a generation or two. There's so much about the novel, its themes uh, on concerning fatism and uh, what a life requires and what destroys the requirements of life. All of that is applicable today. I think um, Dr. Peikoff in his last, I mean, his latest introduction um, to one of the versions of the book refers to it as, this isn't about your grandparents' era. It's, it's a novel you know, pertinent to your grandchildren. And, um, and I think that's, that's right. And obviously we can elaborate on that. Yeah, I think of it, the themes are timeless and the characters are timeless. So Ayn Rand was not what she called a naturalistic writer who's trying to paint a very detailed portion, a picture of one little aspect of early 20th century. And then when you're a hundred years away from that, it's like, who will that interest except for historians? She's creating stories that have tremendous uh, value conflicts and tremendously interesting characters. So if you ask me why you should read We the Living today, it's the story's really gripping, and the characters, you'll never meet characters like this in your other reading and movies and so on. So it's a unique experience. And on that theme, that it's has gone away. I mean, the theme of, of the evil of statism, that is, alas, I mean, that's, um, it might take different forms, although it's surprising how often the same form uh, uh, appears again and again. Um, I was going to say that she herself said it was not a book about Russia in 1925. It was about the wider phenomenon of dictatorship and collectivism. So, and then you say it's, it's still with us today. Um, so I, I thought one thing that would be useful to talk about is the, you know, it, it's fairly grim as a setting. So Soviet Russia, people are lining up for hours just to get some bread. There's a lot of restrictions. Some people might know about what the history was like. And yet, we're here to talk about an aspect of the story, which is life affirming. So the really positive uh, meaning of the story. So let's talk a bit about what does the title mean? What is we living? And how does that fit into this idea of what it means to be a truly living person? You know, it's it's life affirming, but in a 
unusual way for an Ayn Rand novel in that it's, in a way, it's presenting you a picture of what makes the affirmation of life impossible and what, how does one struggle within that? But the, the living refer to the people who want to regard their lives as sacred. And it's not everybody. And it's, um, you know, some people s passively drift. They, they try to make do in czarist Russia and in the new regime and et cetera. But they're not really pursuing their own life as a sacred value. And um, that's what Kira is uh, doing most of all. Leo is someone who in a different world would have, uh, I mean, we, we, can, we can elaborate on that. And then Andre is kind of an, an unusual character, but in that respect. But um, that's what, and, and Kira most of all is the, the most life affirming, especially, well, throughout. She values things in a deep way. And Ayn Rand uses the language of sanctity and sacred and reverence for all the things, for, for a desire to be an architect, um, to build bridges or an engineer, I guess, uh, how she regards the gods, uh, the military bands, uh, the uh, Viennese operetta. It, it's, um, she loves life and she loves her life and, and really wants to pursue it, but she's in a context that makes that um, increasingly uh, impossible. Yeah, I mean, one of the things that I find this is true of Ayn, all of Ayn Rand's novels, there's evil in them, there's evil characters. But even when the theme is about the theme is about the evil of dictatorship or the evil of totalitarianism, the focus still is on the positive. The focus is on good characters. The real conflicts in the novel are between uh, there's a kind of triangle and it's between good characters and the conflicts arise um, because they're all in some ways trying to pursue values. And the theme is that the people who are truly alive, the way that uh, dictatorship, statism, totalitarianism, the way it suffocates the truly living, but the focus still is on what it truly means to live. And Ayn Rand said of her, literary purpose that it was what she's interested in is portraying the ideal man and when she was writing we the living she didn't yet feel that she was uh, capable in, ter in terms of her literary craft in her skills of portraying fully what the ideal is but the whole attitude towards striving for the ideal that you see most particularly in kira who's the young heroine of the novel and her attitude towards she wants to build something truly worthwhile in her own life. That's the focus in a way, even though the theme's the evil of dictatorship. And that makes it, uh, it's, I find it tremendously uplifting, even though there's ways in which you would say, no, it's very depressing, the novel. Mm -hmm. Well, I've been rereading the book lately and, one thing that struck me, at least uh, this, as far as I'm into the book, is that there are flashes and more than that, real moments of joy and an enjoyment of life. So within the constraints and the struggle that the, the main characters face, that there is a, I think one of the things I like most about Kira as a character is her capacity for enjoyment of the time that she had and the, the things that she cares about. And that there's this real sort of a reverence for those moments in life. Well, she, I mean, very early on when she first meets Leah, or maybe it's the second meeting, I guess the second one, um, where she talks about building, uh, is it that when she talks about building the aluminum bridge and she has these ideas and she's very excited about it. And it, you see a real contrast. I mean, even that early in the novel, Leo is saying, why? why bother in effect because he's sort of you know he's, he's given up in a way but she approaches that everything her, her what she wants out of movies out of um, music uh, the people she's around her relationship with arena and um, it's all um, uh, yeah it's throughout and I mean Ayn Rand had a major challenge in the end of the novel and I don't know how much we're supposed to respect uh, 
you know, not you know, avoiding plot spoilers, but um, yeah, I think we should try to avoid that. Plot spoiler. Yeah, what's that? What's that? I think we, we should, should try avoid to avoid that. that plot spoiler. Yeah, it, we'll put it this way: it's it, you know, Ayn Rand said, given the theme, it had to have an unhappy ending of some sort. But even there, uh, she's affirming this what she called the benevolent universe premise. Um, at the you know at at a, a pretty awful moment, but you're right it's it's throughout. But there are there there are moments. I mean, she couldn't have Kira whistling you know and and happy throughout. I mean, there are these moments where you know she's she's um, weeping after hearing uh, um, I think it's Bayadere Kalman's Bayadere uh, because I think she's projecting what that music represents abroad. And that's an interesting concept in the novel too. Um, uh, and, and she, you know, she can't have it where she is. And there are there are scenes that are, you know, she's trying to um, uh, suck up to. No, not that's not the right word, but she's trying to prove to a creature like Comrade Sonia that, um, uh, yeah, yeah, I'm a good Soviet. I go to the meetings and things like that. But it's it's clearly not her. But but the thread is this attempt to find joy in the world. And um, the Soviet Union really makes that impossible, particularly when she's, um, when a career is no longer a possibility, so she turns to her next highest value. And I know Ankar has written about this subject. So, so I, you, you mentioned uh, the, the benevolent universe premise. Maybe you could just unpack that for us briefly, just for people who haven't heard of that concept. So it's something Ayn Rand coined. What is it she trying to capture with that idea? You want to do that, Ankar? Oh, I, I mean, I could say something you, you should add. Um, it's an attitude towards life, and it's an attitude that you can call metaphysical. So it it's pertains to the fundamental nature of reality and man's life in reality. And it, that it's, um, that success is possible and that it's the norm. That is, if um, you can view it, we as a species or you as an individual, if you perform what's necessary to live and thrive in the world, if you are willing to put forth the effort and the actions that are necessary. If you're willing, basically it comes down to, if you're willing to think and if you're willing to produce, to create, to build things, then the what you should expect, the normal outcome is you're going to reach your goals and you're going to reach your values. And you see that this is Kira's whole attitude towards life that she takes her own values. Robert was talking about some of them, about the kind of career she wants to be an engineer and a bridge builder, some of her values in music. And, so, and she doggedly pursues that. So she's willing to put in the work, the thinking, she's willing to study and study long hours to become an engineer. And when it becomes harder and harder to go to school, that she does all kinds of things throughout the book that, she, I mean, she's relentless in the pursuit of her values and that the norm in life is you will succeed if you do that. And that's the sense in which the universe is benevolent. Reality is a place in which man can succeed. But the theme of the novel, if you think of it as it's the evil of statism, of dictatorship, of a totalitarian, is, totalitarian regime, it's that the very nature of these regimes, um, one of the ways it's put is it forbids life to the living. So this makes the, these places a nightmare, but it doesn't tell you something about the nature of reality or man's fate in reality. It tells you something and something en enormously negative about the nature of these systems. And it's not restricted to Soviet Russia in the early 20th century. But of all dictators, and uh, and her attitude throughout, it's never it's never defeated by what she sees around her. I mean, and at the very beginning, she's you know they arrive in in Saint Petersburg, and she's hopeful. You know, she's looking at oh, this is a wonderful place, and, and that's her whole outlook. And then it starts to get shattered, and she sees someone because for Ayn Rand, really the the two 
greatest values would be career and romantic love and the benevolent universe. Yes, there's going to be, you know, accidents happen, people get diseases and things of that sort. But as the norm, as to what you ought to expect is that you can achieve these values. And it, it gradually uh, um, occurs to, to Kira that, I mean, there are certain obstacles that make this impossible, but she never rejects the idea. She never comes to the conclusion that what's happening here, that just is the way of, of the universe. So for, I think what happens for Kira is the concept what for a religious, I mean, her sister Lydia, for example, it's just, we hope for the return of Jesus or, or you know, life in heaven. That's what we're aiming at. But that doesn't exist. It's not what, um, where anyone's going to achieve anything. But for Kira, the concept that I think becomes inc uh, uh, crucially important is the concept, the idea of abroad, that there is a place somewhere. It's not here, but elsewhere. And if we can just get there, then I can achieve these values. And if I can get Leo to get there too, um, and that's, uh, I mean, we're going to see one of the differences between Kira and Leo is one's confidence that that's even possible. Um, but for Leo, it, he's an interesting character because it's, it, it's unclear to me entirely whether he's come to uh, um, reject the benevolent universe premise, as we would put it uh, generally, or is simply concluded it's hopeless in Russia and there are no alternatives or, or something in between. I don't know if Ankar had views on that. Yeah, I don't think of it as he's rejected the premise, but he's lost, he's lost hold on it. So I'm not sure he thinks it's now wrong. But Kira knows that part of her survival and of her spiritual survival is to hold on to the idea that Russia and what she's witnessing now, you can equate that with reality. You can equate that like this is the, everyone's fate uh, as a human being. Whereas Leo, I think, just loses the, the, uh, the conviction in that. Whether he rejects it, I think that's probably too strong. Right. One thing that came up just a few minutes ago, uh, you mentioned this, Robert. I think it's worth digging into. So she uh, Ayn Rand has this view of the sacred and things and and you described Kira Ankar as really devoted in in a meaningful way to her work. She's dogged, she's relentless. So these concepts of devotion and sacredness, these are things that we're used to hearing as arising out of or or uh, inextricable from a religious context. And yet this is not at all, I mean, she was an atheist, she, she didn't at all think of herself in a religious sense, but there, there's something that I think religion is trying to capture or that it's, it's an approximation of what is going on. So how, how do you think she views that, that those concepts and, and how she's using them? It's, um, I think she sees a big part of what she's doing and this becomes clear uh, in, in her in her later works, especially uh, um, well, maybe not especially. I mean, when when Galt in Atlas Shrugged says the point is not to return to morality but to discover it, um, she thinks that that religion, Christianity, has had a monopoly on on ethics, and that that needs to be rejected. But there's all kinds of concepts, um, not all of them. I mean, God, duty; uh, these are are kind of religious concepts that I, I, you can't salvage or shouldn't want to, but the sacred, the reverence, um, exaltation, these are really important. And what happens is what, I mean, what Kira wants to do in a way is focus them on this world and values here, now. And unfortunately, um, what religion has done in a way is given us a, a false alternative, either you worship certain things as you regard them as sacred, you revere them, you, you know, they're, they're the objects of exaltation, and that's all otherworldly, or you reject all that and you kind of cynically uh, conclude that, and eh, we make the, way, you know, the best we can in the world as it is, but sacred values. Um, no, but that's, for, for Kira, I mean, even Ayn Rand, when she was writing Kira, um, for Kira, no, the idea of regarding God and heaven as sacred, 
is to destroy the concepts. It's it's only a real value if you're pursuing it here now. I mean, now meaning on Earth, even if it's a long range value, and even if it's a value that you understand it might be um, impossible to reach if it's just a question of you know getting out of the Soviet Union. Uh, there's no guarantee. One of the interesting aspects of We the Living, I think, a kind of sub theme in it is the how close religion and in this case it's communism is, but you could put it it's broadly communism, fascism, the 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 these doctrines that teach that for something to be sacred, it is outside of yourself and you're to you're a servant, you're to sacrifice yourself for something else. And that's what life is about. And then if you think kind of the conventional conceptualization is if you were devoted to your own life, that's the easiest thing in the world. Just do whatever you want. And we the living, the portrait that you get is it's exactly the reverse. So I think Robert said earlier, Kira's sister is it, it kind of more the traditional Russian religious, that's what she thinks your life should be devoted to. And it's an empty life. It's a life that there's not much action. It's waiting for the next world, or maybe someone will save you in this world. It's the going back to the benevolent universe premise. There's not this relentless focus on, I need to act to achieve my values. And then you get the same for the communist, that it's portrayed as an ideal. And you get in one of the characters, the, I mean, the third main character, Andre, you get like this is the most sympathetic portrait of a communist you could ever get. And Ayn Rand said it's unrealistic in certain ways, but it's going out of her way. Like, this is what it would be look like to be an idealist for communism. And his whole life is... Like, I don't count my, what I want, my personal joys, happiness. That's not important. It's all devotion to the cause. And you see and that as there's something really wrong and really empty about that as well. And that you can't really even hold communism as an ideal. In the end, it, it's about tearing down, not about building anything. Um, and then you say the contrast of Kira, who takes her own life, seriously and that it's something sacred to her the amount of genuine energy and thought she puts into the pursuit of that that's what true uh selfishness looks like and so you get it you're getting already in we the living a reconceptualization of the way that we should think about morality that's very interesting and very powerful and, and we so see um oh, Sorry, um, something. Go, go ahead. interesting about Andre is he has this worldview and there is a sense where you could say um, he regards what he's doing as pro-human, pro-life. It's this horrible czarist unjust regime. And what he wants to do um, is raise up all of mankind. So we're all living this, you know, this, no, I don't think Ayn Rand thought a communist could really believe this, but Andre does. In, in the novel, and that's his view. You get that idea, it's a contradictory one, it's hard to hold, but that certainly is, um, is what, he, what his focus is, why he's going after this. And then he meets Kira, and Kira is, um, I mean, Ankara just said that he has no personal life, no, it's, it's all the Communist Party, and then he suddenly has this private, personal, individual value. And that um, is going to become impossible to sustain as, as in the novel. And that's going to be a part of the, the, the plot of, a, of the novel, um, indeed. But it's, it's, there is a lot more religion in there than, I mean, talk about religion even, and, and the contrast with it. Pavel Siroff, who's one of the main Marxist characters, he, what, how is it described? He, he studied God's law with, little Pavel studied God's law with the parish priest. He was really into Christianity. And then he made the switch. It was very easy to make the switch uh, to, to Marxism. Uh, and there are kind of personal psychological reasons why he does. And we see something similar with, with Eldworth Tui in The Fountainhead. 
Um, and I think is the mother is uh, Galena, I believe, who's happy to be a sort of average Christian. And then things change and you adapt. It's, it's a very easy switch. Uh, but it isn't for Andre and it isn't for, for um, well, Kira or Leo, that's for sure. So you, uh, I thought it'd be interesting to talk a little more about the, the development of Ryan's thought, because you mentioned there's a, a re already a reconception of what uh, selfishness is. And there's a, just to go back to this uh, connection with religion and how Kira thinks about things. So, I, so Kira is fairly young when the novel begins. I think she's 18 when she comes back to Petrograd and she's starting university. So it's interesting to think of it from the perspective of someone that young, so not someone who's an adult who's spent a lot of time thinking about these issues. And what I have in mind is there's a conversation between Kira and Andre. So Andre, as you mentioned, is the, the hero of the, the, he's this idealistic communist and she uh, cross paths with him and then they befriend each other. And it's this exchange where she asks him her upside down question, as she calls it. And it's an interesting kind of insight into how someone young, I think just as a characterization, someone young so, uh, gets uh, into this issue. So I'm gonna read uh, most of it and you can see it on the screen if you're watching us. Do you believe in God, Andre? No, neither do I, but that's a favorite question of mine, an upside down question, you know. What do you mean? Well, if I asked people whether they believed in life, they never understand what I meant. It's a bad question. It can mean so much that really means nothing. So I ask them if they believe in God. And if they say they do, then I know they don't believe in life. Why? Because you see, God, whatever anyone chooses to call God, is one's highest conception of the highest possible. And whoever places his highest conception above his own possibility thinks very little of himself and of his life. It's a rare gift, you know, to feel reverence for your own life. And to want the best, the greatest, the highest possible, here and now for your very own, to imagine a heaven and then not to dream of it, but to demand it. So, I mean, that, I, I find that really powerful and uh, it, uh, it gives me chills to, to have, the, to, to, just to hear it and to, to read it in the book. And what I take from this is it's, it's an early, a very sophisticated, but early rejection of this idea of putting value outside the self, putting value in something above and th this line is really haunting to imagine a heaven and then not to dream of it, but to demand it. So this idea is connected to what you were raising earlier, Anka, which is the idea of you take action for the things that you want in life. That's, what, that, what, that's how you get meaning. That's how you get the things that really matter and enrich your existence. I, I mean, just want to get your reflections on that passage. Uh, there's two things that stand out for me particularly what in relation to what we've been talking about that it it's an aspect of this focus what we call the benevolent universe premise and it's i think earlier alan you said that the, we the living is the most autobiographical of ayn rand's novels and it's not autobiographical in the sense that these events or something like them happened to ayn rand in russia but she's familiar with Russia at the time that she's writing. So the background is she's has seen firsthand. And I think the whole orientation to the positive. So th this I think is Rand's fundamental rejection of religion. And it's not primarily that religion has caused so much suffering on the earth, though it has, I think she thinks. It's that it places the whole pursuit of values of the good outside of this reality, which means outside of reality. And if your whole life, if what the essence of life is about is about pursuit of values and especially pursuit of the ideal of making your life into the ideal that you can uh, envision and then to work to make it in your life here now on earth, and when religion declares that's impossible, that awaits a next life and some other reality, not this one, this one's a veil of tears and so on. 
that to her is um, a, a real philosophical treason to the good and to values. And that's the orientation. And that, that's the upside down question, I think. Like, do you believe in life means, do you believe in values and ideals on this earth? Um, but people won't understand if you ask that. But if you ask them, do you believe in God? And yes, and it's placing all that outside of reality. To her, that's, that is the worst destruction you can imagine. And it's, it's more fundamental than just a, a, a dangerous philosophical error. I think she manifests itself, uh, well, it's really this, the same point in a way that people, they learn because of this outlook to, be, to settle, in effect. You can't achieve that job that I really want. You know, you, I've had some failures in romance, so that, you know, you just do the best you can. And that, I think, is a kind of attitude that, that springs from holding these impossible standards. And she says around the same time she wrote this passage, I actually looked for the drafts in the, um, of, uh, in the archives, and it's around the same time that she wrote her first entry in her philosophical journal uh, where she talks about religion as the real enemy. Now, she later um, had a more sophisticated view of the enemy. But one of the things she thought was um, so destructive is religion made hypocrites out of people. That is, their values are supposed to be you know, God, heaven, uh, religious um, uh, commands that are impossible. And at the same time, you want to try to scrap out, you know, make some sort of life for yourself here on earth. But to the extent that you're successful at it, you're, um, you're contradicting what religion demands. So we're, we're bifurcated beings in that way. And you're not going to be, you're not going to be um, an idealist about your own life, your own happiness, happiness. You're not going to regard your life as sacred. And I think it's, it's Irina who says at one point, um, you know, you have one life. It's this sacred, valuable thing. And, uh, oh, is that the, the passage? Um, it's a sacred treasure. Yeah, I, I won't quote it. Uh, and religion really makes that impossible. You can have a sort of quasi-happy state, but you can't. Uh, it's a sin to regard it, you know, to elevate it, to uh, exalt in it. So I, let me mention that for those of you watching us live, we were welcoming questions. The best way to put your questions in is through YouTube Super Chat. We're monitoring that. For those of you on Zoom, if you would like to post a question, we'll try to bring some of those in as well. And uh, we also have people watching us uh, who are getting Spanish language translation. So welcome to all of you and thanks to our translators for this event. Uh, we're really pleased to be here on February 2nd, Ayn Rand's birthday. And I wanted to just circle back to one of those, what, that aspect of our conversation. So I said at the beginning that Ayn Rand regarded this as the closest to an autobiography as she would write. So what did she mean by that? And what did she not mean by this? So in what, what ways do you think it is by autobiographical? And, and how, do you, uh, how do you understand that? Well. The, she, she addresses this issue and she says the closest thing that captures uh, her, um, what she had in mind by that is the, the I think, uh, Louis Sullivan's autobiography of an idea. So it's, uh, it's Kira's convictions, her outlook, including what we've been calling the benevolent universe outlook, uh, her attitude towards communism, things of that sort. Uh, and she says the details, however, are not. Um, uh, are not autobiographical. However, there's a lot of, some of the details are, and, and that, that can be quite interesting. I mean, the character Leo, for example, certain relatives, although she says not her entire family, um, she was Jewish and uh, the, the uh, Kira and her family are, uh, I guess, probably lukewarm Russian Orthodox uh, families. Do you want to add to that? Uh, yeah. Um, the yeah, I think of it as as Kira's convictions are Ayn Rand's, and I think of it as Kira's strength of character, because there's a way in which the the convictions of Leo and Kira are the same, but the 
Kira is an enormous presence in the novel. From the moment you meet her, there's, there's just this is an iron will. And I think that's, I mean, when I both, both from reading Rand's all her published work and reading some of the journals and so on, I see and letters that that will I think of as that was Ayn Rand's mm -hmm. will. So in that sense, it's very autobiographical of this is that this this person who will um, not let any obstacle deviate them uh, from or block them from their path. And it, that kind of resolve, I think of as that was Ayn Rand's. Um, and it's, I get the sense, I mean, I never met Ayn Rand, I don't know her, but I get the sense she wasn't particularly interested in her history. So the idea of writing that like somebody else would be interested in her history, I, I don't think she could ever write that. So this is, but that it's the closest still she'll ever come to writing. I think it, it would have bored her to write her autobiography and she wouldn't understand really why anyone would want to read it. Though I, it would be interesting to read, but- Although we all would. <laughs> And there well, are, I mean, there, there, I wouldn't be surprised if the, she had that God question that she asked people, and she probably got an answer from communists very often that if, if she, to the extent that she interacted with them. And I mean, there's a passage where, um, uh, is it uh, Victor who, uh, who, uh, well, you, you have to think about society. And she responds, you know, society, it's, it's a series of zeros. And if you add them up, it does, you know, she she just she makes these kind of comments. She wouldn't let something like that slip, and I imagine that was the uh, that was Ayn Rand in her family and uh, um, interacting in school and all. So, and there were things. I mean, there are important autobiographical details, and actually, this connects to certain things about the 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 the, the um, extent to which the novel is still relevant. Um, Ayn Rand witnessed uh, the student uh, purges, for example. I mean, she went through these kinds of things. She wasn't in, in, in the engineering school, but she was studying history. And um, Robert, maybe you can just fill us in a bit about the history. So just to flesh out what, what was going on, what were the purges? Well, the, um, when, when the revolution, when the Civil War was over and the revolution was pretty much won by the Bolsheviks, uh, the, um, you know, the university didn't automatically just become Marxist, uh, uh, although I, I mean, it took a while to get the faculty out and all that. But the idea was that um, Bolshevik universities should be, you know, we should not be teaching the enemies of, uh, of the revolution, right? The, the enemies of the proletariat. So they did, um, they discussed, you know, they had interviews with students uh, asking all kinds of questions about their background and their convictions. And that's why you had to kind of jump through hoops and to prove, and Kira has to do this at certain times, you know, you have to be willing to read a paper on Marxism and go to club meetings and things like that and say, oh, yes, I'm, uh, you're, you're, um, now that's where Leo has, uh, is sort of different because he's, you know, I'm not having any of that. But the student purges where you'd have young people sort of interviewing people to see if their convictions were correct. And if they weren't, they were out. And that's a sense in which I, I think there's that vibe in the novel. Where we're not quite there yet, where I see, I mean, I'm in academia. You get the, there are certain views you aren't uh, uh, supposed to hold. And if you do hold them, uh, you shouldn't be hired. Uh, and perhaps you ought to be fired. Uh, and more and more we're seeing, um, I've seen this myself, uh, um, universities where students are issuing demands about you know, what kind of professor should be hired, whether they're tenured or not, et cetera. And so when I re, when, the last time I reread uh, We the Living, I thought there was this, it sounded very current. <laughs> um, that vibe, even though it, uh, you know, like I said, it's not quite there, but uh, in the sense that there's not been, you know, we're not a Marxist society and it's being imposed, but they are state universities and, uh, you know, there are, these are ideas that, that are being um, instilled. And, and the idea that 
it's the form in which proper, you know, we say politically correct ideas ought to be held are, you know, yeah, this is what you, if you're a decent human being, uh, this is the kind of idea you ought to have. And uh, that, I think, is becoming more and more common uh, in academia. And I think an element of that, and then again, if you read We the Living from the perspective of thinking, it's rejecting both religion and what's coming to replace it, which is the communism. You see a similarity between it, and I think it's a similarity that Robert's bringing up to the present, that you can put it as you've got to have the right ideas, but they're not really ideas. It's You don't have to have any reasons for the ideas. You just have to spout what is the official line. And you, you see in We the Living already, and I think this just became worse in Russia over the years, it's people, oh, okay, I have to spout this, the, 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 that uh, history is a, a series of class struggles and so on. I don't have any evidence for this. I don't have any reasons. I don't have any arguments, but this is what I have to spout, just like when you spout religious dogma. And it's not like, what's your argument for that? And do you have a counter argument? Are you rejecting it for good reasons? And the, the same atmosphere today, it's not when they want to toss out professors with the wrong views. It's not like, look how bad the argument is and look how there's no evidence. It's just, no, you don't have the party line. And if you ask them, like, can you give me an argument for the views that you hold? Most of them can't. And these students, um, if you watch the, I mean, I, the, I think it was very telling, the Brett Weinstein episode, and you see his engagement with students and it's, you've got the wrong views. And he's asking, well, here's my, re he's giving, here's my reasons for my views. And so what are your reasons? They don't give him any reason. They just shout him down. And it's that, it's the, that kind of mystical, dogmatic atmosphere is, um, you certainly see it in We the Living and it has echoes today, unfortunately. Yeah. So I want to connect a couple of things that have come up to some of Rand's later work. So you described Kira as having aspects of Ayn Rand's values and convictions. Uh, I, I often think of Howard Rourke uh, when I think of Kira. There, there's definitely that independence in her that she she doesn't care what's going on. She doesn't uh, bow to other people or conventional. She doesn't conform. She decides what she wants and she goes after it. And, and I, I see that. Um, I wanted to talk a bit about um, the sort of the character of Andre, because he's really, and you mentioned um, Ellsworth Tui earlier from The Fountainhead as the, the character. So there's, I want to just put those on the table because Andre is a fascinating character. He's, he's a, he, I find him very sympathetic, <laughs> which surprises me because he, and he's a, He's the hero of the Communist Party. He has a very powerful position in the secret police, I believe. And yet, and, and he's idealistic. And yet, so here's someone who is, I think we're, we're meant to, rec to respect him. Um, and yet, so the question is, how credible is that? Is it, is it a realistic kind of uh, character? And, and that, the reason I brought, brought up Tui is that there are aspects of Tui that bring up that kind of question. So what's your take on, on Andre as a character? I, so I, would, I don't- oh, Go ahead. Oh, no, okay. No, no, go um, I don't think he's fully realistic. And that was Ayn Rand's view about it, um, that you couldn't actually have someone devoted in this way to communism in, in, as, a, as a kind of crusade, his life's crusade, and he's, um, I mean, he's part of the secret police uh, after the war and so on. So it's, if, if you take seriously what that means, he's done a lot of evil things. And that you could think that what communism is about is about building things up rather than destroying people and depriving the, of life to the living, which is, it's, he comes to that realization, but that you could have someone so idealistic and seemingly clean, I don't think that's realistic. And I think Ayn Rand's skill as a novelist is to be able to portray 
a communist as as uh, very sympathetic, and it's Kira respects him. Th that that it's part of what makes the conflict in the novel. It's a, as I said earlier, it's a conflict between good characters, and it's they're pursuing different things, and it's a value conflict. That, that like that's integral to the story, but it's there's elements of if you're really thinking of a communist at that time, and if you're trying to find the best, Andre's better than the best you'll find at the time. And and one of the ways she's uh, she she succeeds in doing that is we get a kind of uh, a biography of of Andre very early, and he's actually he was I don't they weren't friends, but they were in the same neighborhood I guess Pavel. And she kind of described the two of them together at some point. And he's very heroic. I mean, I think his father died, you know, fighting the czar and, and fighting against czar, the czarist regime was a, could be uh, a noble enterprise. And he was involved very early. He had convictions. He risked his life to achieve things. And then he was a hero at what, Sevastopol or you know, one of these major battles. And so she presents him as someone with strong convictions because at that same battle where he was a hero, Pavel missed it because, uh, or I mean, mixing him up with Siroff, um, it was the same person, uh, because he had a flu, he had a cold or something like that. Yeah. So she presents this her heroic guy who is a man who has strong convictions and they're directed at destroying this czarist regime, which is corrupt and rotten. And, and then she makes it, you know, there's a, a transition into becoming a party member and then part of the ruling party. And uh, but she does describe him as you know doing awful things. I mean, she doesn't underscore it, but it's there that he's the GPU and he's he's uh, you know doing the stuff that is done to people in dungeons and 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 all that. Um, but it's presented as someone who um, wanted to raise people up. And, and a part of the part of his mistake is the idea that you can't regard human beings as a sacred value unless it's the individual human being. And because you can't say man or society or the working class or whatever and have that as a sacred value if you're killing people who disagree with you and and uh, and all that. You can't. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, the only kind of human life that deserves this kind of sanctity is the individual. And so if you, if you think the masses, that's uh, your object of, of um, that's what you regard as sacred. No, it's, it's impossible. Or, or, or the fetus rather than the woman who's carrying it. I mean, no, there's only one possibility that really conforms to uh, life and its conditions and its, and its success. And that is the individual, and that's um, that is what Andre discovers, but um, at a point where yeah, there's nothing to be done. Uh, and in terms of the theme of the novel, that it's about the evil of statism of totalitarianism. I think the character of Andre and the whole story is interesting from this perspective because it's not focused on gulags, concentration camps. It doesn't take the worst manifestations of communism or totalitarianism and say, look how evil this is. It takes normal, I mean, what normal under communism conditions it takes the, it portrays the most, as I said before, the most sympathetic portrait of a communist you could have. And it's still the sort of verdict of the novel is there's still something monstrously evil about all of this. So it, it takes it in its kind of best light or manifestation and says, no, there's still something tremendously anti life about this. And that is such a more powerful indictment, I think, of it statism or totalitarianism as a system than if it's you're focused on the gulags, concentration camps, and the, the kind of reply will be, well, that was Stalin or that was Hitler. If we had better leaders, that would not have happened. <clears throat> so let me bring in one of the questions we've gotten so far from the viewers. Um, so this is a question about Leo. So we'll, we'll 
talk about the third of the main characters. So Leo is the son of a, an aristocrat and he is really cultured and he befriends Kira. We won't say exactly how, because I think it's part of what's exciting about the story. Um, but you've already mentioned in, in, in summarizing aspects of the, the novel that Leo really struggles and he doesn't have the same fortitude as Kira. And so the question uh, that has come in is, what is the main virtue Leo lacks that makes him sort of lose hold of the benevolent universe premise, as you put it, Ankar? Um, I mean, he, he doesn't have the same strength of character that Kira has. His circumstances are more precarious than Kira's. I think that is relevant to the, he's, he's persecuted under the system. Uh, Kira is just, it's slowly, she's coming to find that the system puts obstacle after obstacle in the pursuit of her values, but Leo's persecuted. He's actively pursued and they want to destroy him. So there, there's that difference. Um, but I, I've written about this in uh, the Roberts collection. And I, if, if the questioner is interested in that, I'll refer them to the collection for a, a more in-depth discussion. But there, there's a point in the novel at which I think both Kira and Leo experience our future has been shattered. It's like our future is now impossible. And Kira has a, has a kind of substitute cause. She now knows she's not gonna be an engineer. That career, there's no possibility. Uh, it would be now unrealistic for her to think that that's what she should, should sort of continue to pursue. But she gets a substitute cause. And I think that by the nature of the way Ayn Rand looks at the, their relationship, it's, I mean, this gives away some, but it doesn't give away the ending. It's her substitute becomes, she's going to devote herself to Leo. Um, and that for uh, Leo, it's, he, he can't have it as now my life is gonna be devoted to Kira. It's just it's for Rand, it's, just, it's, that's, it's not a possibility for him. And I think that's, his, it, that's the end for him. Um, when there's no future, I mean, life for a human being is about focused on building a future. And when that is completely gone, it's, he has nothing to live for. And it, it's what, what Ankar was referring to, given Ayn Rand's view of masculinity and femininity, it's, um, that wasn't an option, I think, for her creating this, this story. But also what struck me the second time, I've read the novel many times, but the second time I read it, the first time you kind of fly through it, I was surprised at how early there are signs that Leo had given up. Um, I mean, I think it's very, it's not after, it's not a part of the novel, you know, a series of events that leads him. It's very early on where he says, I can muster the, the strength, you know, the heroic strength to fight lions. I can't do it to fight lice. And, you know, where he, he asked, why are you so excited about, um, you know, building? We can't achieve that here. So it happens very early. And you're right, it is, it, his father has been executed. I mean, that's all kind of the backstory there. And he's being pursued. But there's, yeah, it's, um, he's given up on the possibility of it. And I see that, uh, you mentioned parallels with, with the Fountainhead before. I think there's a sense in which he's like Dominique in a way. Dominique's view was uh, at the, you know, the beginning of the novel, uh, throughout a lot of it, it's everything or nothing and everything's impossible. So I, I'm in effect, um, I'm going for nothing. And that I think is Leo. Leo's not, um, well, I'm pragmatic. It's not the best world, but I'm going to make the best of, of that I can. I'll try to, you know, squirrel away some money and, and all that. No, he gives up. And uh, well, I don't want to. Um, he gives up pretty early, and I think he he concludes pretty early that uh, there isn't much hope. He doesn't have this. Um, he doesn't have abroad 
uh, as an option in, in his life. And so he, yeah, his way out is, is um, kind of sad. And there's a very revealing scene, and I hope it's not giving away too much, where, um, well, it's pretty late. I, can I talk about Leo the Gigolo? Or, uh, I mean, it's, uh, there's something very significant about that, because Kira at, at a certain point says, why Tonya, who if when you read the novel, she's horrible. Um, why not, and, she, and the language is very interesting, you know, someone young, fresh, modern, foreign maybe, why not pursue someone like that? I don't think that's Leo's way. And I think it's because if he were to kind of, okay, I'll be a hedonist and I'll try to be successful and I'll find someone and I'll, um, that would be diluted for him. That would be a kind of, um, you know, because he even tells her, I think in a year, maybe I would, maybe I'll pursue someone young and, and fresh. Um, but hooking up, so to speak, with this person, Tonya, is, is sort of, you know, I want everything in, out of life, but that's impossible, so I'll settle for uh, nothing. And um, I think that what's interesting about Dominique is she's living in America in the 1920s, and that's very different from uh, Russia in the 1920s, and yet... I think she has this uh, a, a similar kind of view, but but it's more metaphysical. Uh, I would put it that way. Mm -hmm. So let me bring in a few more questions. We we're coming close to the end of our time. So let me ask you on behalf of the viewers. One is about uh, the philosopher Spinoza comes up in the novel. Leo reads him at one point, and so the question is: Was Spinoza an influence on Rand's life or work? when she lived in Russia or, or subsequently? You know, I think, um, I'd have to check. I think in the first version, she has Kant uh, instead of Spinoza. And then she changed that. I mean, I can, well, I won't take the time to check. I'm pretty sure. Uh, and because she later had a very negative view of, of, um, of Kant, but Spinoza is, I don't know enough about, uh, he is a kind of egoist. Uh, um, it's been years since I've read him or studied him. So, um, but I don't know that he had any kind of, uh, she knew of him, of course. And I think he, I think she wanted to present that um, Leo was going to study philosophy and he was very erudite. You know, he quotes uh, um, Oscar Wilde and things of that sort. and. Uh, she wanted him. She wanted him to quote a philosopher, but one that wasn't terribly objectionable, I guess. And uh, that—that's the best I can do. Uh, maybe Ankar has some ideas. Uh, no, I think that, it, and I don't think if you're thinking of Ayn Rand's thought, I don't think Spinoza has an impact on her thought. Okay, so a question on religion, um, a challenge to some of what's come up already. So I'm going to read the whole thing. Um, aren't you caricaturing, quote, religion? Isn't religion basically your understanding of the way the universe is ordered? Uh, isn't what you call the, quote, benevolent universe premise uh, basically a religious conviction? That's certainly not the objective truth and would be disputed by many. So, so I guess a question about your conception of religion and is the benevolent universe premise um, really just the borrowing from that? Well, um, I'll answer part of it. Uh, at, um, maybe Ankar can answer the rest. The, the idea of it being a religious conception, um, no, unless it's, it's... I remember, I think it was George Gilder who criticized Ayn Rand for, for um, you know, claiming to be a benevolent, you know, believe in the benevolent universe, but then she doesn't believe in God. And clearly what's going on in his mind is the idea that if the universe is benevolent, it must be because it was created by a benevolent being who had a purpose that was a good. Um, and that's not what she means at all. And it's not, um, it, it's not the case that if someone has a view, as we've described uh, the benevolent universe premise, that therefore it must in some way be religious or smuggling uh, in religion. Um, I also don't think that anything we've said is caricaturing uh, a religion at all. On the contrary, I would say um, people who 
I don't know the person who asked the question, but people who tend to make that charge tend to see as a symbol of religion, post-enlightenment, very low-key sort of um, religion that has uh, managed to get along in, in, in modernity, and that's not what the essence of religion is, and it's not um, what makes religion dangerous, or, and what Ayn Rand is criticizing uh, in religion. And, and for the benevolent universe premise, I think one should see that as a premise that is directly challenging religion. So it is taking on an issue that religion, so an important issue in life that religion says something about, but what it says is um, completely wrong and even perverse, I think. So the idea, and it if you take particularly Christianity, the idea that you're born with original sin, a sin uh, and a black mark that is not the result of your action or choices, but something that happened in the past with the fall of Adam, and that has stained you, and that you're incapable of doing anything to put yourself back into the, on the side of the good. You have to await God's grace, which is you have to await supernatural intervention that he's going to save you. And the part of the whole story of Christ on the cross and so on is this kind of supernatural uh, intervention where you're somehow receiving God's grace and so on. This whole picture places the pursuit of values and particularly the pursuit of the ideal as outside of your hands, outside of your power. And if you take the uh, kind of one of the extreme versions, I mean, that, that version is already, I think, perverse. But if you take the kind of Cal, the Protestants and Calvin, and it's the chosen and the damned, and it's pre-selected, and God's decided this, and there's nothing you can do about it, and so on. That, if you take that kind of view seriously, it is a recipe for anxiety throughout life. Am I the chosen and the damned? on the damned and I, there's nothing I can do about it. It's, I mean, you're riddled with anxiety and the whole message is the pursuit of values and the ideal is outside of your power. The benevolent universe premise is it's, um, it's not that there's a benevolent God. It's that the universe, universe one of the ways it's put in objectivism, it's auspicious to human life. If you put in the thinking and the effort, you can succeed. So the whole orientation is towards action, value, pursuit. You can succeed. You don't, you're not stained with some original sin, nor do you have to await a supernatural intervention. You can do something about your fate now. And Rand's view, I think, and I think rightly, is when you, the religion, religion taken seriously, and particularly the Christian teachings, it's the opposite of that. It destroys that proper orientation towards life. So I don't think it's an accident that she uses benevolent universe premise. The whole idea of the Christian God, he's a benevolent God. And then there's this big question that is unanswerable of why does a benevolent God allow uh, destruction, evil, earthquakes, and so on. And the orientation you get from Rand is no, you have to make something of your life. It's possible to do it. And you, if you think of the theme of we the living, there is evil in the world. It's evil people with evil ideas. And you need to oppose this. If part of your pursuit of the good has to be to be able to recognize and oppose evil, not some supernatural evil, but the evil that human beings are capable of. And that's part of the the message of we the living, of trying to, to see uh, clearly what actually is evil. And if you know the in America in the 20s and 30s, the intellectual world is celebrating communism and celebrating the great experiment in Soviet Russia. And the novel's message is what you're celebrating is abominably evil. And it's important. It's not the focus in life but it's important to be able to recognize evil for evil. And this is, so the benevolent universe premise is a direct challenge to religion. It's not taking it over. It's saying the whole perspective in religion is wrong. And we could say the same thing, mutatis mutandis about Islam. And 
So, I mean, it's not just uh, uh, Christianity. And the question was asked more broadly about, uh, about religions. So we, we've come to our time. I just wanted to um, gather some of the thoughts here and offer you guys a chance to, uh, you know, any final thoughts before we, we wrap up. And I, I'll just share mine, which is, as I said, I'm rereading the book once again for fun. Uh, and I've really been enjoying it. I, I love spending time with Kira in particular. I find her to be a, a fascinating character. And it, I think the, the, we haven't talked about these, but there are an, a cast of, sort of support, supporting uh, characters in the story, all of whom are integral to the, the theme and the plot. And it's interesting to see how they uh, react to the same kind of conditions and circumstances. So I, my, my final thought is that if you haven't read We the Living, and I know there are fans of Ayn Rand who, for whom this is probably the book they get to last. I'm not sure why, but it's a shame they're missing out. I think this is a lot of value there. If you haven't read it, uh, pick it up. It's great. Uh, I think you'll, you'll really get swept up in the story. It's a fascinating, fascinating plot. And then if you have read it, I would recommend a couple of things for you to do, which is um, there's a course that Onkar has on our website called uh, Analyzing We the Living as a Work of Philosophy and a Work of Literature. And then, of course, if you want to dive even further, um, read the collection of essays that Robert put together, Essays on We the Living. I, I've learned a lot from, from the, those essays. And there are some of the questions that have come up and that have been posted um, are answered in that book in depth and in really uh, scholarly rigor too. So I highly recommend that. So let me go to uh, uh, Robert and then Onkar for final thoughts. I, well, I concur that it, it's, um, it's natural that people would come to We the Living Last because they, they hear about the Fountainhead and Atlas Shrugged. But for some, I know that there's this letdown. Uh, it, you know, it somehow it, it doesn't have the, uh, it doesn't have what the others have. I, I don't want to ruin things. And yet, um, I mean, Ayn Rand said it was her best plot, that it's better than, you know, Fountainhead and Atlas Shrugged, and those are pretty well plotted novels. So, I mean, I find it a, a really excellent story. It's more in line. On the one hand, it's more like a, you know, I think in standard 19th century, at least a Hugo kind of novel. On the other hand, it's pure Ayn Rand. Um, it's, uh, yeah, it's it, it's it's um, it's just a, a terrific work, and and as I think we tried to emphasize, it's a very I think it's a very important uh, novel um, with all kinds of connections to the twenty first century, for good or bad, but for good um, um, especially uh, as far as good answers are concerned. I'll leave it at that. I did. I, I did read We the Living the Last because I went in reverse order. I read uh, Atlas, yeah, Fountainhead, and, and then We the Living. So, um, but yeah, I think the, the, the main message is that read it for the story, read it for the characters. And there's a way in which the, the rest of Ayn Rand's writing is an elaboration on We the Living that it's the, and, and this is, whether you're young or old, Kira's attitude and whole orientation towards life, that's what you're trying to achieve. It's, this is what I wanna be. The rest is, how do you do that? And when Ayn Rand said like, she wasn't yet ready at We the Living to portray the ideal man, it's how, it's all the premises and conviction. But what you want in the end is to have uh, uh, Kira's attitude towards values and towards her own life and that she regards it as sacred. That's what you're trying to achieve. And to get just the depiction of that's the attitude. And then the rest is sort of details that the wheel of living is, if you read it in that spirit, I find it enormously powerful. Well, thanks. I should mention that as we were talking, some of the photos that you uh, were seeing on the screen were from the movie version, which we didn't get a chance to talk about. Uh, it was made in uh, Italy under the fascists. It's a really fascinating story. We'll, we'll do that another time. Uh, it's really hard to find these days, unfortunately, but if you find it online, um, you can. I think the DVDs are available. I think it might be out of print right now, but if you can find them used, definitely worth it. 
uh, I think Ayn Rand was uh, she supervised the editing of the movie when it was surfaced. Uh, it was made without her permission, uh, but later surfaced. And then she made some edits. And I think she I think she was pleased with it overall. I don't I, I think that's a fair read. But again, that's a topic for another time. Thank you, uh, Robert and Onkar, for joining today, and thank you all for joining us on this uh, episode of New Idea Live. Uh, if you enjoyed this. Uh, uh, episode, please like and uh, subscribe to our channel, like this video, leave a comment. We'd like to see what you think. And if you're watching on Facebook, uh, please like this uh, stream so we know you liked it and you could help us bring this uh, to the surface and reach more people as we go. And if you ever have thoughts about uh, what we do, we'd love to hear our feedback. If you have suggestions, if you have ideas for further topics, you can always reach us by email, newideal at einrand.org. Until next time, thank you for joining. See you then.